Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning for this V-Meet for the hair and beauty sector uh, in South Wales. Uh, my name is Tim and I'm one of the directors of the Educate Group, uh, which incorporates ISA Training, who, as many of you will know, is an apprenticeship training provider specialising in the delivery of hair, beauty, barbering and nails qualification in Wales. The purpose of today's V-Meet is to provide an opportunity really for those of us in the hair and beauty sector to come together uh, and look at some of the challenges we're all facing now and that we're all likely to be facing uh, as we come out of, a, uh, of this COVID-19 crisis and really to take a look at what the world might look at like and how it will affect us all. To do that we've invited some guests who are experts in their field and who can give us a great insight and some advice that's specifically relevant to us. There'll also be a question and answer session at the end uh, and during the course of the V-Meet I'll also be asking for feedback from salon owners and managers who are on the call with us here today. Uh, there are over 80 odd people, I think 86 people, um, salons have um, accepted the invite to join today which is fantastic and we really hope that you find the next 45 minute use, minutes useful and, and worthwhile. Before we start I think we've asked everyone to mute their, their, <coughs> excuse me, mute their microphones um, and if you are going to ask a question at the end, please remember to, to unmute it then. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get going. Our first guest today has worked in the hair and beauty industry all of his life. He has an exceptional knowledge of all aspects of the industry, from salons and spas through to the retailing side, franchising, training and the education, as well as e-commerce and the online sales within the sector. In his role as the CEO of the Hair Council, Keith has kindly agreed to join us today, this morning, give us his view on where the sector currently stands. So, Keith, thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to unmute your uh, microphone and I'll hand the baton over to you. Lovely, thanks very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this morning. Um, always a pleasure to see what I can do to help industry as a whole. And if I can uh, give some guidance this morning to your listeners and indeed to yourselves, I'll be delighted to do so. Um, just a quick update on the Hair and Barber Council. Um, we're a statutory authority set up by a government act of parliament. So we are the, if you like, go-to place that government currently goes to um, for sort of uh, advice, opinions, and any support or information they need um, regarding the industry as a whole. And when I say that, I'm talking about Hair Barber and with our, our beauty partner, Babtac, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, they obviously link in with us on more beauty related items. Um, obviously, we've all been living through this now for what, 11, over 11 weeks now, and uh, many things have come out in the wash what's been going through. Um, we took the decision very early on that we would support uh, not just our members, of which we have around about 11,000, but um, also the industry as a whole in terms of uh, supplying sort of evidence, support, um, information, help, just anything we do to help the industry and that's what we sought to do. But bearing in mind that the prime platform for the Hair and Barber Council is to effect mandatory regulation for the hair, barber and beauty industry, that is our main platform as far as we're concerned in terms of our organisation. Um, whilst we also look after our members and everything connected with that, that is our main platform to try and uh, regulate the industry. Where we are currently, and there's been a lot of fake news coming out, as no doubt all of you have heard over the past uh, few weeks. Um, where we currently stand at the moment is that the hair and barber sector, not quite so clear on beauty, but I think they're in the same position, um, is that we're going to be allowed to open on July the 4th. That is still the date. Um, providing the R number, which is the reproduction or infection number, remains below one in the interim period. Now, it's interesting because one of my big concerns was if the R number went above one, let's say, I don't know, in the, in the, in the Midlands somewhere, for example, whether that would affect the whole of the rest of the country. Uh, but thankfully, what is happening is that uh, they're saying that they will look at it, if you like, region by region. So it wouldn't necessarily mean a continued lockdown uh, for others that are not in that particular area. As far as government guidelines are concerned, I've been working very closely with BEIS, the Business Energy and Industrial Strategy Department, with regard to trying to get some draft guidelines for industry to follow, because there seems to be a real mix here. Um, some of industry, as no doubt you know, uh, have al already gone out and purchased staggering amounts, in some cases, of PPE whereas others have done nothing because they're waiting for the guidance. Um, 
who's right and who's wrong with that, nobody knows. But until we've got the guidance, people may well have spent money they may not have needed to. But then in saying that, they need to make sure that they're protecting their own staff and customers to the very best of their ability. And I think this will be consumer led as much as anything in terms of uh, what the customers will expect to see when they come into the salons or the barber shops. Draft guidance was um, supposed to come out at the end of last week. Uh, I had an email on Friday afternoon to say that it had been delayed. I don't know why. Um, and it will be coming out sometime this week, but to date we haven't had anything, so I can't give you an update on that. But I stress it will be a draft, so whether it will be workable or not, because my concern with this throughout the whole of this is that whilst the industry certainly needs draft guidance, and a lot of the industry is calling out for it, um, it's got to be workable and it's got to be able to, for us to be able to work to make our businesses viable. In other words, there's got to be a balance there. Obviously, health and safety and hygiene is of paramount and critical importance. Uh, and I've said to all our members and to industry as well that um, you need to ensure that uh, whatever you're doing to protect your staff and your customers for coming back into the business, you need to communicate that very strongly to them because there will still be a large amount of consumers that even though you know we're open and we're saying everything's safe, they're going to be very, very concerned about going back uh, at this point in time. But as you probably heard on the media, um, hairdressing, barbering and beauty has got a huge step up in terms of focus and spotlight over these past few weeks, which has been great for the industry in terms of public perception. And indeed, I've been able to say to the government, this is how much our industry is needed. You know, it's well-being. It's not just a haircut or a colour. It's well-being. It's interaction. It's feel-good factor. It's all those things that, that make us feel good. So I think um, our industry... Uh, as a whole has gone up quite favourably in terms of the eyes of politicians. I'll stop there, um, but obviously I'm open to take any questions uh, that you would like. Thank you, Keith. The uh, One thing I just want to ask you, uh, get a bit of clarity on, is you mentioned the date of the 4th of July as being yeah. as a potential reopening date. Does that apply in Wales as well? Do you no, know? But actually, I should have said that. My apologies. No, it applies in England. I'm trying to get some clarity on Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as we speak. Um, <laughs> I've heard it muted, and I don't know if this, this is true, that, that, that um, Scotland is going to be August. I do also know that as far as Wales is concerned, I know you're... Uh, your government is uh, proceeding, I think, quite cautiously. Um, so I'm, I can't give you a date on that. So my apologies for that. But it's the 4th of July in England. No problem. Uh, late, later on in this meet, we've got a, a topic and a section on um, PP uh, in the salon environment. And are you sticking around? So, so yeah, yeah to... I'm happy to sit around. That's not. Um, I can only stay to half past 10. Now. I've got another webinar at 10.30. No problem. OK, well, thank you very much for, for that, Keith. We'll have a Q&A yeah. at the end as well. Um, I'll move straight on to our, our next guest. Um, A&R Cleaning was founded 10 years ago uh, by Raina Davis and have grown enormously over that time into one of Wales's major commercial cleaning companies. Uh, I'm not going to say how many people A&R now employ because the last time I gave that number, I gave the wrong number and Raina told me off, which was mildly terrifying. Um, every single salon in the country uh, will be facing the same challenge when we reopen. And that is how to deep clean and then maintain the premises in a way that reduces the chances of COVID-19 being transmitted. To give her expert advice on the topic that will affect us all, please give a warm welcome, as much as you can electronically via a VMe to Raina Davis, who is the Managing Director of A&R Cleaning based in Bridget. Over to you, Raina. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, I know I for one have definitely missed the salon, so uh, there's definitely going to be a bit of a hype when you all return. So I don't think you need to be worried about uh, whether there's going to be enough work, but I definitely think you need to consider taking, you know, sort of extra measures, depending on what your setup looks like now. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint and open screen. Uh, sorry, bear with me one second. So there's there's a lot of underlying factors that, that people might not consider when they look at the, you know, your, your industry is hairdressing or beauty or barbering, and that's what you're passionate about. So there's a lot of things that go hand in hand when you have your own salon or you're providing a service like that. Um, one of the things that hasn't really had a lot of uh, presence, and I would say when you go back, the salons has been closed for for weeks and weeks on end. And one of the things that's not out there at the moment is Legionella. 
Now, I don't know what your uh, understanding or knowledge is of Legionella disease, but when you've got water systems and you're washing, you know, hair, you've got the, the water coming through the pipes, uh, that's been sat stagnant for weeks on end. So I would, the, the first thing you need to look at doing is when you go back is, you know, flushing your systems because that is a risk not just yourself, your staff, but also to your, your customers. So um, I have got a HSE link, which I will share with uh, Tim later. So you can have a little look at that. And it just goes in to say what, what your responsibilities are when it comes to Legionella. Uh, another thing that I know I want to talk about cleaning, but there's a lot more than just cleaning when you're ready to step back up. Um, a few things that I think you need to consider when looking to reopen is how you deep clean your building, but also what products you're using to deep clean. There's a huge difference between buying your products from someone like Home Bargains and just using a general product than then going to um, a, you know, a, a cleaning provider or a, uh, what's the word, sorry, um, somebody that actually provides cleaning products and actually asking for their expertise advice in what you're actually cleaning and what products are the best products and some of the products that we use kill things such as they kill the, the one strain of the coronavirus it's currently being tested for the COVID-19 um, but some of the products do kill things like flu viruses, MRSA, um, listerias and there's a lot of products out there that are superior when it comes to cleaning so I would highly recommend that you do invest some time into looking for products and you make sure that you sanitise in highly touched areas. So that's anything from, we call them hot spots in our industry, and that's anything from your door handles and that's inside and outside your building. You need to make sure that you are being visible. You're going to have people coming in, evidently that's going to have a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, but there's a need and a want to have their hair done for not just a image perspective, but from a um, you know, well-being perspective as well. It definitely gives you a boost when you have your hair done. So making sure that your customers and your staff can see that you are touching, uh, sanitizing hotspots, the arms of the chairs, you make sure you're sanitizing them on a regular basis the chairs, the door handles, and, and even to the toilets, um, making sure that you've got some sort of cleaning schedule in place and that is visible. It, I know there's a section about PPE, but I'm just gonna touch on PPE. There's, at the moment, I don't know if it has been announced what PPE you will need, but I think more from a mindset perspective and a visual perspective when you're dealing with customers, they. It's, it's like the analogy, isn't it? Or the perception of things are only clean when you can smell cleaning products. But there's a lot of cleaning products out there that are superior. They kill so many viruses and bugs, but they're non-fragranced. So just because it doesn't smell, it doesn't mean to say that it's not good. And I think that's the perception with when you're looking at PPE, people want to see you in you know, are you wearing maybe a mask? You know, what, what distance can you put between you and your clients to cut their hair safely, but also make sure you're protecting them because, uh, you know, we know to have your hair done, it's very close contact. Um, so you need, just need to be reassuring your, your customers that even if it's not, stated that you have to have certain PPE. I think from a mindset, it, it's just going to be good for consumers point of view that you do show that you take an extra precautionary measures. Rina, can I just put in a quick question for you? Oh, um, of course you can, yeah. When you say sanitise areas, for example, like the yeah. arms of the chair, what, what does that look like? Is that an antibacterial spray? Is it a wipe? Uh, what is the best method to do that? Is it a, a cloth or paper towel? What, what does that look like for a salon? Yeah. Salon industry, um, I would definitely say disposable is probably the best. Um, it, it depends on what their washing facilities are like. So if they've got plenty of washing facilities where they can wash and dry, they should effectively be using either a microfiber cloth. So with microfiber cloths, rather than J cloths, you've got microfiber cloths, which are, when, when you look at them through a mic microscope, they're held on with like, um, they, they're kind of made out of tights and the material holds 
So when you wipe the surface, the material holds on to all the bugs and bacteria. And then when you go to the sink and you rinse your cloth, all the bacteria gets released. Whereas when you're looking at sponges and J cloths, they hold on to so much bacteria. So if you wipe in multiple surfaces, you're just picking up, spreading, picking up, spreading, whereas microfiber will hold on to the germs. And when you're looking at the product, there's a difference between a cleaning product and a sanitizing product. So from a deep cleaning point of view, I would recommend you use a product that actually cleans, especially when you go back in. So you will have products that clean. Um, you could have pH7, which is a very liquid product. So th things like that, products like that are cleaner. So they'll break down dirt, grease and debris. Whereas a sanitizer you would use after you've cleaned, which then kills all the viruses or bacteria and germs. So there is a big difference. Um, but I think from an industry perspective, it's just, it's, it's about being visual. Um, Anti-black wipes are fantastic because every time you've got a turnover of clients, you can make sure you, you know, it's very much like the flu, isn't it? Catch it, kill it, bin it. And I think it's that message when you're looking at the anti-back wipes, you're catching the virus, you're killing it by crushing it in the anti back and you're also binning it. There's that perception as well of what, what you used to do. And I know in salons, we see everybody sweeping the floors constantly. How often do you see them wiping everything down? And I think that's going to be a massive change in salons now is that, that visual um you know just seeing people actually cleaning clean, seeing risk assessments up on the walls um you know what measures you've taken and actually seeing it seeing a cleaning schedule so people so if i come in and i come in in an afternoon appointment from a customer i would want to know who sat like if somebody sat on my chair before it has that been cleaned um and i think it's about maybe having where you've got the the mirror Maybe you just have a you know a simple process where you say new customer process and you put step one, step two, step three, step four. So if I sat there and I'm waiting for you to go mix up my colour, I can see what steps you've taken before I come in and sat on the chair. And I think from a peace of mind, that's going to be key to to ensuring that your customers feel safe whilst they're in your premises. I don't know how I am on time, Tim. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, am I okay? So if I just any questions, just just ask. Um, one thing we are doing a lot of, and I know it's slightly different in offices, um, but even in the hospitality sector, um, you see them in supermarkets now, is pop-up stations. And again, that's a really effective way. It's visible, and you could just have a pop-up station which has anti-back wipes, blue or white center feed roll. Um, your hand gel and your, your wipes, you just put a few things out on the desk. So your staff can see every time they walk past, they need to sanitize or do they need to sanitize their hands? Do they need to use an anti-back wipe on the door? So maybe having them, um, you know, a pop-up station as people walk in and in the seating area and also for your staff then. So about putting pop-up stations is fantastic and it's visible. And just going back on to the actual cleaning, uh, again, it depends on what knowledge you have of the cleaning, but I would definitely show people how you've implemented a colour coding system. So with the colour coding system, normally I see in salons, and I'm just going from what I see in salons, I normally see a steam mop, and salons tend to have kitchens, toilets, corridors, and the actual salon floor, and if you go into the toilet, I normally tend to see just one steam mop. Now, my perception of that is that mop's being used throughout the whole of the salon. Um, I would definitely implement a colour coding so you can show your customers that you're using a different mop. So you could have red for your toilet, which is what we use. And then you've got blue for everywhere else. So if you're mopping your floors, you're showing, you know, and you could even, it, and, and it is all about being visual. I think for you going back, you could have a little sign. So people, whenever people pass your mop and back at station, eh, put a little sign up to say, you know, Colour coding, we use blue for general areas, which is the salon, green for kitchen, and then your red for your toilet. So again, if I'm coming in, I, I feel totally safe coming into your premises, knowing you've taken so many extra precautionary measures. Uh, another thing that I just want to touch on, I know I've mentioned a lot of it, is about being visible, but it is all about having a 
like I've mentioned, the pop-up station, but it is about, you know, if you've got apprentice, apprenticeships working or apprentices working for you, you've got your members of staff, having them or having a training guide for when they come back. I mean, they, they normally are there and they might empty the comb on the brush, the hair on the brush and stuff, but they need to up their game. It's not just you as a salon owner, but it's also your staff. And I think that training needs to come from you. So I would definitely spend a bit of time on putting some methods together and uh, you know method statements on how, how they do things. So after every time you've cut or dyed somebody's hair, what is the process for them to, to make sure that they fully sanitized everything? So do they, bear me one sec, my daughter's just come in. <laughs> Oh, right, okay, sorry. Sorry, bear with me one sec. There you go. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, my, my daughter just popped in. Um, where was that? Yeah, to just, you know, from my point of view. Sorry? Yeah, uh, we've got about one or two minutes left. Yeah, that's that fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just on the last one or two slides that I've done, so that's fine. Um, yeah, and from the items that you're using, what systems are you going to put in place for sanitizing them? So again, the anti-back wipes are fantastic because you can sat, you can wipe down your straighteners, your hair dryer. With your brushes, I wouldn't just take the hair out of them. I would ensure that they are they are, you know, disinfect you use some sort of disinfectant or cleaning agent and you've got enough equipment that you can go between client to client without the use of having to go from my hair to another hair to another hair with the same brush and I think it's all about showing that to your customers and the last thing I've just put together is just little things you might want to jot some of these down is things to consider when going back um, and things that are touched quite often is magazines so where are you when it comes back to magazines in your waiting area what is that going to look like um, your pop-up stations, which I mentioned, uh, your PPE, what PPE are you going to need? Are you going to give any to your customers? Uh, and what is your max occupancy level? So when you are in your salon, what does that look like? And the big thing, which I'm here for, is the cleaning. What does your cleaning regime look like? What schedules do you have in place? And are they visible so people can see that you've really taken this serious and you've done everything you can to bring them back? Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll keep saying the pop-up stations are fantastic as a visual aid to show your staff and your customers. So yeah, hope you found any of that useful. A uh, few things just to consider on your return back to work. And I can't wait to get my hair done. <laughs> the, uh, no, it's interesting actually. And one of the messages that's come through from what you said this morning is it's not only the actual cleaning regimes you put in place, but the confidence that you give customers so that they're visible and people can see it uh, and we can build confidence in the public as well um so yeah that's that's come through loud and clear are you sticking around for the end so if there's any yeah any yeah, yeah if anybody's got any questions or any advice they want on products or anything yeah by all means i'll stay around thank you thank you so much okay. uh, this guest today gives up a lot of his time helping small and medium-sized businesses uh, DWA accountants have offices in cardiff swansea and bridge end and their managing partner stephen griffiths is here to give us an overview of some of the business challenges presented specifically by the current COVID-19 crisis. Stephen, can I hand the baton over to yourself? Oh, you might, you might be on mute, potentially. Sorry, can you hear me, Tim? Ah, I can now. Phew. I, 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 things are going too smoothly up until that point, so <laughs> I, I panic. But no, we um, can see. I, I, my apologies, I've had some sound issues. So I'm I'm somewhere in between both um, laptop and mobile at, mobile at the moment, apologies. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, thanks for, uh, for joining us on this call. So yeah, Tim's asked me just to run through uh, a little bit about the financial support that's available out there for, for businesses. Um, there's obviously a huge amount to take in. So some of this will be, will be quite generalized, I think. Um, but I'll try and keep it as broad as I possibly can. Uh, I'm sure everybody has already had, uh, an influx of information from various sources, uh, whether that's from your advisors, family and friends. Uh, Martin Lewis, who's become the man in the pub, who's uh, happy to throw out the information to everybody without actually checking the facts on things. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of some of the stuff that we uh, that we know is tried and tested. Um, so firstly, let's break it down into two separate areas. There's 
there's support available in the form of grant funding um, as opposed to, to borrowings. And the difference there, of course, is if you're in receipt of grants, then they're non-repayable. Um, so clearly that's a, a more attractive option to many businesses. Uh, there's probably four specific grants that uh, the businesses should be, should be considering. Um, the first would be the, the Economic Resilience Fund. Um, so the, the first fund, uh, the first phase of that fund has already been launched uh, and fully used up. Phase two uh, is about to be launched uh, in the middle of June and be worth another 100 million. Uh, if you employ up to nine people, you can get up to 10,000 pounds as a grant. If you employ more than 10 people and up to 249, um, and unless there's any super salons here with over 250 employees, it'll apply to you. Uh, you can get up to £100,000 in terms of grant support. Um, obviously, that's great. It's, it's non repayable and it's a welcome welcome boost. If you've already been in receipt of, of the fund from the first phase, you'd be eligible in the account. Um, but again, bear in mind that this will be launching uh, in a couple of weeks' time, around about the middle of June. Uh, second one to consider would be the non domestic rates grant. Um, importantly, that is going to close to new applications uh, at 5 o'clock on the 30th of June. If you haven't already been in receipt of your non-domestic rates grant, uh, you need to give some, uh, some thought to that. Uh, and broadly speaking, depending on whether you have rateable value uh, of up to £12,000 or up to £50,000, will determine whether or not you're eligible for a grant of either £10,000 or £25,000 from your local authority. Um, again, Applications are closing in about eight weeks time. Sorry, in about four weeks time. So you just need to be mindful of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, third grant to consider would be the uh, the coronavirus job retention scheme, more commonly known to most of us as the furlough scheme. Um, now the furlough scheme has been around uh, since uh, since March. Uh, it's been extended now until the end of October. The um, the furlough scheme is incredibly complicated. Um, but in, in its broadest and simplest sense, uh, the government are going to pay you 80% of any furloughed employees' wages, certainly for June and July, where they'll also employ as NI and any pension contributions. Uh, from all they will continue to pay you 80% of the furlough, you'll be responsible for the NI and the pension. And then for September and October, that drops down to 70% and 60%, which means that there's a requirement from the employer to top that up by 10% and 20% in both instances. Uh, so still a good scheme, but obviously as the months roll on, it becomes a little less, uh, a little less beneficial than it was at the, at the outset. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of what furlough is, but just in case somebody's uh, not been reading the news and is wondering why we're all here today. Um, in short, if you have employees who you have no work for and you don't particularly want to lay them off or make them redundant, you can put them onto furlough um, the government will make a contribution towards their pay. You're able to top it up if you want. Um, but the important thing is that from July, you're able to bring people back on a part-time basis and the government will still pay an element of the furlough pay. So that gives you the nice balance between bringing back in and maybe doing one or two days work um, and having the government still pay a contribution for the remainder of the week. Uh, as I say, it's quite a complex area. If you haven't already spoken to somebody, you should take advice on what this is going to look like in the coming months. Uh, the fourth and final grant to bear in mind is relevant to is the self-employed income scheme. Um, last Friday, it was announced that there will be a second tranche of that scheme. So if you are self-employed, um, you could have already had up to £7,500 in a grant, um, although it is capped at uh, the average of three months trading. So 7500 was the most you could have got. Second tranche um, applications for that need to be made by the 13th of July. So again, you've got about six weeks to make those applications. Um, that would be up to a value of £6,570, again, capped at 70% of your average monthly trading profits. Um, so again, well, uh, if, you, if it applies to you, again, the scheme, the scheme rules are somewhat complex in terms of working out the averages. Um, you will need to take advice in, in some instances um, and quite annoyingly for us um, that isn't allowed to make the claim on your behalf so again by all means speak to your advisor but it may well be that you need to, to do that yourself but get a little bit of guidance on, on how that, that actually works so those are the four main grants that are available out there and as I said the beauty of those is that, that they're non-repayable uh, I should caveat that with um, 
the government will be very keen on, on clamping down on anybody that uses those fraudulently. So obviously not that I would suggest for a moment anybody on this call would do that. But just bear in mind when you're making these applications and you're ticking the boxes to say whether you've been impacted or not, um, that there may well be some, some degree of auditing of this at a later date from, uh, from HMRC and, and local authorities. Um, in addition to the, to the grants that are out there, there's also some funding. Um, for people depending on who you're banking with. Um, the original funding that came out was the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, or the Sybils as it's known. Um, that scheme is running until the end of September 2020. Uh, you can borrow up to £5 million on that, but in reality, most people are not going anywhere near those numbers. Uh, if you're borrowing up to £250,000, then you shouldn't be required to complete a personal guarantee. Some banks are still a little bit, uh, little bit difficult on that. Um, but in, in place of that, to that, they then introduced the bounce back loan scheme, which came out a little while ago. Uh, that scheme is going to run until the end of November 2020. Um, some banks have been fantastic on this, uh, dealing with applications, processing them and having them funds in your account within 24 hours. Some of them are still hanging on now a couple of weeks later, um, varying degrees of success, as I said. Bounce back loan, you can borrow a thousand pound or 25% of your turnover, whichever is the, whichever is the, the lowest. Um, and those are the main ones. There are still traditional funding routes out there for um, overdrafts and loans, but clearly they're not at the competitive rates and the terms that the, the bounce back loans and the interruption loans are. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that the banks are only gonna lend to you if you would have been a worthwhile business before coronavirus. Um, so you need to be a business that would be sustainable if you were already struggling, unfortunately, they're not going to be giving you any further support. Certainly not through those schemes. There may still will be an option that you can get it through one or two of the other schemes, the more traditional ones, albeit they're more expensive. Um, and those, those in, in reality, in, in the short space of time I have, would be the four or five or six main areas that you need to think about uh, in order to get some financial support and assistance into the business to tide you over through these incredibly difficult times. That would be me, Tim. Yeah, Steve, is there one particular go-to resource that you can recommend where a lot of this information is condensed into one sort of a bite-sized piece? I think there's an awful lot of signposting. You open LinkedIn, you open social media, you, even you look at the BBC news apps, etc. And it tends to send you off in 50 different directions. Is there one resource you can recommend that uh, yeah. small businesses can go to? And off a lot of what you said this morning. Yes, so I mean... So, so business.gov.wales is very good for, for Welsh local businesses as a, as a signpost. Um, uh, so that's business.gov.wales slash coronavirus advice. Um, I can send these through in the chat if, if you'd like the, the links on those. Uh, and then the GovUK website gives you more details with regards to the, so that would be more, sorry, the Welsh one would be more for economic resilience fund and the non-domestic rates grants. The, uh, the furlough scheme and the self-employed scheme I would suggest you go to the gov.uk website, which is pretty good at signposting you on there. Um, and as far as the loans are concerned, you just need to speak to your, your own bank. Generally, um, your banks will only deal with it. You can't take that. At the moment, they weren't accepting applications from other banks. Sorry, the banks weren't accepting applications from non-customers unless you set up accounts with them. So yeah, your, your, your bank is the first port of call. With the bounce back loans, they're very easy, very straightforward to get in, in the majority of cases. And without referencing anybody in particular, Barclays have been the best. Okay. Um, the, just one last question before we go. And I don't know if you're available if, in 10 minutes for a QA and a at the end. If, you, if you're able to yeah, stick no. around, that'd be great. Um, did I hear you mention earlier that you have to apply directly? You can't ask your financial advisor, you can't ask your accountant to apply on your behalf. Did, did I hear that correctly? So if you're self-employed and you're going for the self-employed income support scheme, um, HMRC very helpfully um, told, the, told us that we are not allowed to make the application on behalf of our clients, um, but we should be expected to help our clients to make the application. And what that means is that we were allowed to give all the advice that we can, signpost them um, in the, in the pre-COVID days. They could have popped into the office, sat by the side of us, and we could have effectively keyed it in for them. Um, you can still do that to an extent remotely. But yeah, it's, it's a scheme that they, they won't allow the agent, the accountant, to make the application on behalf of the, the, uh, the client. Okay, 
Steve, thanks very much. That, that was really useful. And just to let everyone know, all of the links and information that the contributors have given us today, we'll gather together after this call and we'll put into one email and we'll send that to everyone who's registered to be on the call today. Thank you, Steve. The world after COVID-19 will look very different to what we've all been used to. Our new ways of working will need to be adopted by many sectors, not least our own training sector. The hair and beauty sector needs a flow of incoming talent, all of whom need to be trained, and the apprenticeship programme plays a critical role in that process. However, in a post-COVID world where access to salons and learners might be restricted, how might that look? What is the training sector on which many salons rely on uh, doing to face up to the new challenges ahead? To give us a bit of an insight, uh, we're joined this morning by my colleague, Simone Hawkins from ISA Training. Simone, can you take over from here? Yeah, sorry, sorry, Tim, I'm still on mute. <laughs> that is the phrase of this crisis, isn't it? It You're is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's nice to meet you all virtually. Um, my topic is very interesting because we're not 100% sure what it's going to look like when we get back into the salon. And as you can appreciate, apprenticeships still obviously need to go forward. Um, I think you can all agree that we were forced to change this way in delivery. Um, there was no choice. We currently deliver 100% learning virtually. Um, through probably pulling our teeth out from training consultants um, and the quality team, um, throwing their delivery up in the air, I think we've all had to learn very, very quickly the ways of the new world. Um, I think with the new apprenticeship the, the focus has to still be the learner um, and we really really need to drill down in the learners needs and and also the salons um, to be able to continue their their apprenticeship journey um, i think we can't resist against the change and we've currently started to learn from our um, lessons learnt what works virtually what doesn't what in um what learners like to, um, enjoy the confidence of our staff um, so it's given us a good, good, good opportunity to be able to build back better um, and focus on the learner. So I can tell you a bit about what ISA training and the Educate group are doing um, in terms of, of um, hairdressing apprenticeships. We are currently redesigning the whole teaching and learning aspect to ensure that 100% can be delivered online. Um, I think it's important as well when we talk about um, maybe a second wave, we need to be able to be prepared to continue our apprenticeships uh, with learners, be able to still learn, still have the opportunity um, to showcase their skills, obviously in a new way. Um, so we're redesigning the teaching and learning. We can't uh, redesign, obviously, the apprenticeship because we have to obviously work with awarding bodies, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, we're also um, putting all of our resources, so every resource that the learner would need, um, we are putting it all onto a Moodle. So the Moodle is 24 seven accessible for a learner um, with every resource that they need. So they can still continue their learning without um, their tutor. Um, we're also working with industry experts because we need um, their, their voice on, on, on things that we're doing. Um, we are also going to work with employers. So I'm happy to set up um, a Zoom's meeting with anybody that's interested. Um, to obviously have your input in redesigning the apprenticeship delivery um, and obviously working with City and Guilds. So City and Guilds are our main provider at the moment and we have VTCT who um, we deliver our beauty through. So it's working with them to be able to design this new apprenticeship. Um, they're currently working with Ofqual because we have two stages. We have learners that are already on an apprenticeship um, and we need to be able to adapt um, their assessment criteria to be able to complete these learners. Um, there is a big talk about whether we can or can't because it's very, very driven, um, heavily driven on direct observation in the salon. Obviously, we're not able to do that. And there is a health and safety aspect of completing this learner virtually with, with not being in the salon. So there's kind of um, talks about what type of learner or how far they needed to be into their uh, apprenticeship, whether we can gather other evidence. Um, so it's a two-stage approach. We have that, and then we have the new delivery, uh, working with the awarding bodies for the new apprenticeship moving forward. So, um, because we, we can't, well, 
there's, there's no change. We're going to have to do some virtually, which brings me on to some stats. Um, we spoke to our uh, delivery staff, uh, sent out a short survey and about delivering virtually because at the beginning it was very um, barriers up. You can't do this. The learner won't be engaged. Um, however, 78% of our staff said it was enjoyable and easy. Um, I think they liked having a cohort of learners together. Uh, learners could do it this in their own time um, and it could be set up on a mutual agreement. Um, we then went on to our learners to ask how our learners feel about it and it was actually 91% of our learners enjoy um, teaching and learning virtually so they actually like it more than our staff which is probably uh, correct because learners are more probably tech savvy than, than us. Um, some of the negatives were nothing you can fix, um, some were internet problems, um, some were uh, technology problems, but 91% of our learners is pretty high um, to be able to, to learn virtually. Um, our next stage is to talk to obviously employers because we need to make sure that this is adapt adaptable in your, um, obviously your salon and your working environment. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically that from me. Um, any other updates will um, come out to do with adaptation and the new delivery. We'll make sure that that's, um, the, the, the information is given to you. Um, but any questions or anybody wants to be involved, um, just let me know and I can set that up. Thank you, Simone. And um, just, just to let everyone know who, who is already an ISA customer, uh, over the next two or three weeks, you'll be contacted by your customer account manager. Um, and they'll be looking for your feedback because it's not only what is convenient or what, what we might think might uh, work, it absolutely has to be driven by both the learner and the employer and the salon owners. Uh, so we'll be looking for your feedback as to uh, how the delivery of learning do you think will fit your business going forward. Clearly, I think Simone is fair to say that digital and virtual delivery is going to be a, a bigger part of the mix going forward, but it is still going to be a mix, isn't it? When we take away, I don't think the human element. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, if you've got any queries, I'm sure someone doesn't mind if you reach out to her or if you contact your, your customer account manager if you are an ISA customer. If you're not an ISA customer, feel free to get in touch uh, and we'll ask her, answer any questions you have regarding what the training might look like going forward in a post-COVID world. I'm gonna move on slightly. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, a few minutes if that's okay, but I think it's been worthwhile because some of the information has been given across, or all of the information has been given across today has been, been really, really interesting and useful. It's fair to say that all businesses will need as much help and support as possible to get back on our feet once lockdown restrictions are lifted. Here at Educate and ISA, we'd like to play our part and provide as much support to salons and set-ins of all sizes, whether you're a customer or not. And, and that's a really important point. This, this VMeet today uh, and the support mechanisms that we'll be putting in, this isn't about us just looking after our own customers. We'd like to play a supporting role for the entire sector across South Wales. There are a few things that we've thought of uh, in the short term that we think we can help with and details of these will be sent to everyone uh, in the email after this call later today or tomorrow uh, and in that email we'll pull together the information from the other contributors as well. Firstly we think we can help with marketing. In the email that you will receive will be a link to a simple form that you can complete when you have the information you're able to do so. The form will detail what date your business will be reopening, what times you're intending to reopening, uh, whether you'll be accepting bookings and how people can book in and what services you'll be offering and, and probably as well what services you, you will not be offering. We'll then compile all of these forms that you send to us and we'll group them into geographic areas. And we'll probably use the unitary authorities as those geographic areas and then we'll promote those through our marketing department. So this allows us to help you by informing the public when your business is going to be open for trading, how they can book in and what sort of services you're going to be offering. I appreciate nobody's going to be in a position to complete the forms yet, but once you are in a position to send that information, uh, we can promote it via our social media platforms, via our websites, and we use all of the resources that we've got together uh, as part of the Educate group. Likewise with recruitment, if you have vacancies that you wish to set, uh, fill, I will send you details in this email as to how we can help you promote your vacancies. We'll comply a list of all of the vacancies right across South Wales, uh, and we'll promote them again uh, via, via all the channels that we have available. And we'll also make sure that our customer account managers are available to everyone. Again, not just our ISA customers, but anyone who wishes to speak to us um, and who requires support regarding training, sourcing of staff, or re-engaging with the apprenticeship programme. 
All of these details will be sent to you shortly, as I mentioned in the email. Uh, but if there's anything that Educator ISA can do to help your business, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach out to me directly or any of my colleagues uh, if you already have an existing relationship. If we can help, we, we will. I'm going to move on now slightly uh, to talk about PP in the salon. It's, it's, it's the last topic of the day. Uh, Karad, can I ask you to share the graphic? And I don't know if Keith is still on the call. I know he had to go at 10.30. Um, I've just got a quick question for you, Keith, if you are still here. And I'm, I'm guessing he's not, which is fine. So this graphic was released in the national press uh, a couple of days ago, and it's probably quite a useful um, graphic to point, uh, prompt some discussion, really. Um, I, I was going to ask, actually, and bring in at this point, uh, Ian Davis. Um, Ian, are you on the call at the moment? Okay. But if he enjoys us later, so I'll try and bring him in. I, I know that some of our staff had spoken to Ian and he'd gone through with them the sort of measures that he was uh, bringing into his salon. And I think it was really good advice. Um, if, if Ian's not on the call, we can't bring him in now. What we'll do is we'll collate that advice and put it into the email to you afterwards as well. So looking at the graphic, Raina, I was wondering if you can talk us through a moment as to the sort of PP you think salons will will need. Do you think it would be necessary? And I appreciate some of this advice will come from government, but for masks and head shields, for gloves, is that a practical uh, solution in a salon? Will aprons be necessary? Uh, and also whether in terms of hand hygiene, I would imagine gels would be quite awkward with hair and whether soap dispensers would, would be a better solution. So I was wondering if you've got any specific advice for salon owners regarding PP and hygiene. Um, I and I think it's, I definitely think there's, there's more risk. Um, I know there's a bit of talk when it comes to um, using hair dryers because it's, it's very much like the hand dryers when the virus or any viruses or germs or bacteria are already airborne. As soon as you put a fan on or the hand dryer on or even the hair dryer on, those viruses then just, just become flown all over the place. So there's a lot more risk for somebody on the other side of the room catching the virus, even though they say there's that two metre distance. When you're using certain bits of equipment, I think that's definitely something. And I think that's where they may look at the visors, um, how they protect. Um, I'm not an expert in what PPE you need, but some of the things we've put in our office or for our team is we've implemented a one way system. So you can put... Um, there's a website online, I'll send the link on the group actually, it's a fantastic website and you can choose, it, it's probably one of the cheapest ones I've come across, um, especially when money is, is a big thing right now for everyone. Um, the stickers on the floor, so you know you can put your stickers on the floor, you can buy the tape off them and definitely implement some sort of visual system in place. When it comes to masks, I think the masks is more about protecting other people than it is of yourself it's what you're exhaling what you're putting out there um, and when you cut an air as I said earlier you're so close to somebody you know if you're cutting somebody's fringe or if you it, it's really difficult um, unless there's an invention that brings out a long scissors with a micro um, or something on it which is not going to be possible I think it's 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 about working with what you've got but as safely as you can so whether it's whether it comes out or not as law it, you know the, the government will release those measures but I think from a from a safeguarding point of view you know you don't want to be and um, I've read a couple of articles um, when I was looking into this and some of the articles that have come out about limiting face-to-face -face conversations you know and so that there is so much to consider and think of um with the hand gels they're a quick way but they still recommend you wash your hands so if for example you've got an apprentice carrying you know are they going to be offering cups of tea anymore? So, you know, you've got somebody making a cup of tea, touching a cup of tea, then passing it over to the next person. So do you put a anti-back alcohol hand sanitizer? So when the person puts it down, if I pick up my cup of tea, I can sanitize my hands. So it's, it really depends. I think it's, um, that, that, that visual image is a great visual image of what it may look like when it comes back. Cash is a big thing. Will people be taking cash or will they say no cash? Have you got systems in place where you have card facilities or not? I know there's a lot of shops accepting cash, so I, I don't know how that is going to be perceived in the hairdressing world. But 
I think that, that image is kind of what it may look like and what our offices look like. We've got sanitizers as people walk in, we've got signs on the door, we've got instructions what people need to do when they enter the office. So yeah, it's um, it, it, it's totally different and a big change going back. And I definitely think that, that image from what I can see of it, it's a, a lot of the key things, temperature testing, is that going to be a thing that you're going to implement? I know a lot of offices have implemented that. Is that something that you're going to have to do to safeguard your other customers in the building? I think the graphic's quite useful and we'll see it in the um, email that goes out afterwards because basically yeah. the advice given to other sectors, lots of these uh, look reasonably familiar. Um, if we can just go back to the there, Karen, thank you. Uh, payment methods, I, I think probably this is the start of the phasing out of cash. Lots of sectors that are open now. Garages, for example, and some of the retail outlets, the advice was that they shouldn't take cash. That's clearly a consideration, I think, that all stands are going to have to look at. But protective screens, particularly around reception areas or where there's customer facing outside of just the chair, um, that's pretty common now. If you go to the supermarket, you'll see they all have perspex screens. Um, but these, these aren't insignificant costs uh, that are going to apply to businesses if they are indeed uh, made mandatory. Uh, One-way systems, um, not having people waiting inside the salon, even things like beverages, drinks, teas, coffees, magazines you mentioned earlier, clearly they all add to the risks. Until, until there's clear guidance, clearly nothing is in stone, but I think we, this graphic is a very useful uh, way of prompting thoughts, I think, and, and we'll, we'll get that out to, to everyone after this meeting. Tim, can I just add to this add to that thing? Oh yeah, sorry, Grant. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So just just to add to that, obviously that that's a graphic about what 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 it could look inside, and obviously, um, part of the challenge is going to be capacity. Then you know there's going to be a reduction in capacity potentially, uh, and therefore, um, salon owners and businesses may need to consider uh, different opening hours, uh, and staggered opening hours to to in order to support that change in capacity. Uh, and that's something maybe to consider uh, those opening hours and what that looks like uh, and whether that goes into the evenings or earlier mornings in order to lengthen the day and to be able to provide a higher capacity uh, against the, the, the changes that are going to happen in the salon and in the businesses. Can I just mention one thing there, Tim, if that's okay, Grant? Um, oh. Just following on from what Grant just said. Capacity level is going to be massive. Some of them are saying you can only run at maybe a 40, between 30 and 50 percent capacity based on the size of your salon, the time you put your staff in that salon. So I definitely think if you haven't already considered is looking at ways that, because you've still got your fixed costs, you've still got your fixed overhead, but looking at a way where you can generate additional income from targeting you know, more product sales and um, do you bring in extra bits of equipment that you try to sell to your customers? Because I think that's a big thing. You know, if you're if you're opening longer hours, and you know, if you're used to earning, say, I don't know, a thousand pounds, for example, between eight and five, you may only be able to bring in, realistically, maybe three hundred pound or four hundred pound. You've still got your fixed cost, your overhead, your rent, your your rates, and everything. So how do you? how do you top up that income and i think that's definitely a bit of food for thought is what people need to consider is what are they doing to um to bring in that extra revenue it would be good to get the thoughts of as much as i don't want to put anyone on the spot if you're if you're happy wait uh, i know we've got wayne Keane from us two salon in porth call on the call wayne if you're if you're happy to chip in it'd be interesting to know how you guys are are planning to reopen I'm glad you asked, actually, because uh, I, was, I was going to ask permission if I could speak. With regards to this, I mean, we were, prior to the shutdown, we'd implemented some very strict hygiene measures where, as a client left the chair, everything was cleaned instantly. All equipment was taken away and replenished. Um, all members of staff were responsible for their own workstations and um, the strict hygiene measures were implemented throughout. The difference now, that, and I think this is the key thing that we're all gonna suffer, I and mean, I don't know how many of you have actually sat down and worked out what your break-even figure is, because the effects of this and the way that it's going to um, affect our potential incomes is brutal, quite frankly. Um, you're looking at yeah, 50% or less capacity 
we're fortunate in that we have 19 workstations and if we go every other i can at least have 10 clients in at any given time because of the available space we've got four four basins and i can use sort of two of those four bases and as one client is relieved from a given a given station that can be cleaned in preparation for the next one but there's still an available space for them to go to um waiting areas waiting areas are very questionable at present time because a lot, a lot of salons don't have you know considerable amounts of space we have available space where a client can be moved perhaps from a basin to relieve a space so that another client can be there so that you can keep that sort of continuity, the sort of continuity that we're used to. Um, especially when we do things like delegate um, colors and various other procedures, blowies, et cetera, to um, other members of staff in order to be able to work to our most effective capacity to make, monetarily to make it work. Um, and so this is a considerable, you know, this is going to be a considerable burden. It's going to be a test for us all. Now, with regards to PP, I've already got in all of ours um, face masks, shields, gloves, aprons, um, with regards to um, such things as laundry, uh, bringing in a second washing machine, extra tumble dryer. Um, for us, again, we have the space to be able to accommodate it now we're doing away with what was our fridge and there will be a small cooler for um personal you know sort of personal items drinks etc but every member of staff now ours have all got their own lockers now their lockers we're going to bring them in they're going to have to clear out their locker and that will be for the basic personal effects instead of this big you know you imagine it's full of all sorts makeup spare clothes and sort of things like this but they've got to clear them out and I'm giving all of my staff their own PPE so that they don't have to touch anybody else's even down to simple things where we've got touch screens every member of staff will have their own pen with um, a stylus on it so that they don't have to touch any of the screens all of our keyboards I've got covers for the keyboards drinks and things well I'm seriously considering getting in um, a drinks dispenser with disposable cups um, it'll be simple that we'll only have one thing because that'll be, um, it'll be a simple just a very simple teas and coffees and disposable cups that all goes now with regards to uh, magazines magazines no more i mean with regards to i mean we used to place um, some ads in various magazines and have those all of those all of that's gone that's cut from our budget anyway as an excess um and uh no more magazines if clients want to read they have to bring digital devices you know simple things such as this everybody's got them they can all they can all provide those no problem at all cash cash is a major issue i think they, i think we're going to be a cashless society before we even know it again tipping and things such as this um something that a lot of people you know they get tipped well it makes a difference to their incomes now we're going to have to find a way around that in terms of whether it goes again generally you know that if you go to certain restaurants the tips go in and then they end up getting taxed or not this is going to be a, a you know a hit for a lot of people so, you know, how do we go about that? Is it, can you disinfect it? You know, it's, it's most peculiar the things that we have to consider. Um, spacing, how sounds got the space? We, you know, we need to sit down and do the numbers and see what you have to do. You've got to know, again, how do you adjust your pricing? Because your pricing is gonna to have to reflect the salon needs. You know, I've worked it down to what we need to turn over per hour per member of staff per hour to make this work. And it bumped up the prices considerably. Now clients aren't gonna like it, but we're gonna to have to find a way of making it work. We're gonna to have to find a way of building out those sales. As you say, additional sales, making sure that they're retailing properly, extra marketing, that you know, your staff are gonna to have to be fully genned up on all of their product knowledge. 
Um, now, with regards to training, it's going to be very, I've always enjoyed a very, very strong training regime. My salon was always closed on a Monday and exclusively open just for my staff to train. I would spend a day training all of my staff. Every 10 weeks, I would bring in the entire team and do a workshop with them. Again, in order to make this work, that's not going to be possible because we need every bit of time that we can to be hands on. And so I think, how do we implement that training? Do we offer them the opportunity to volunteer to come in? I mean, when I trained, I would do my training after hours. And I was happy to do that. It was a privilege to be able to be trained by, you know, very capable people. And they gave me their time and I gave them, certainly offered up mine and would take every opportunity. But that isn't the mindset of most trainings these days. You know, and society has changed drastically. But we need to be able to provide a suitable standard of training in order to make your businesses function properly and to ensure their futures, you know, moving on. Now, um, another thing I've considered when we consider about how we're going to make this work, if you, um, in terms of being able to attend to the volume of clients that we have in a reasonable time scale, yes, extended hours. Um, I've got, um, there are 12 of us in total when we're all in salon. So I've actually considered split shifting so that I've got two teams for the simple reason is if we're doing this track and test thing and somebody tests positive, that whole team can go down. And then that's your salon closed again. You know, even though nobody else may be affected, but you've got 14 days of quarantine to consider. So with that in mind, I considered splitting my team into halves, working them in opposite shifts of six hours over six days instead of eight hours over five. Um, the sweetener there for them is the fact that they have <coughs> half a day. You know, they, they can come in earlier, they can finish earlier, or they come in later, they finish later. So you've got part of your day. That's a luxury we never had. So this has the potential to work. And also, I tend, I've always tended to work late because life isn't nine to five. And I've got a lot of business clients that need to be in before or out or come in later. Now this can, this can draw in, has the potential to draw in a lot of clients that ordinarily wouldn't be able to attend during normal hours. So we've got to make it work, you know, consider these things and we can make this work. But the one thing that is going to affect when you do your break even figures, it's going to really affect your pricing structure. And it's something that clients aren't going to like, but they're going to have to affect, but they're going to have to accept. You know, so these are some of the things that I've considered, you know, I've actually considered, you know, sat down, done all the maths, um, considered what we need to do, the constraints that it's going to make upon us. Because after all, other than doctors, nurses and the like, we're one of the few people that is actually constantly touching somebody for the duration of our services. So we need to be properly protected. But I think one of the safest things is to make sure that everybody in your salon is fully aware of what is expected of them and that you actually provide them with the training and that they sign for that training to say that they fully understand it because you've got to safeguard yourselves as salon owners. You don't want anybody sort of saying, this happened to me because I wasn't told. So you need to go through, basically have meetings with them all and to go through and implement a strict protocol. And then the disregard of which has to have consequences as well. Otherwise they won't follow it. They think it's unreasonable or perhaps you think, oh, all of this fast. But no, it has to be done. And it's something that you need to go through, implement that training, make sure that they sign it for that training to say that they fully understand it and that they are all responsible as part of your team for the moving forward of your business. Wait, I've just got a very quick question for you, if that's okay, before we move on to the yeah. a element, to do with the physical setup of your salon. Have you looked at the Perspex screen? Is that, and is that something, if Carrie can cycle through some of the images, something well, that you've looked at, will be going ahead with or that, not? That is completely unnecessary because you've got a screen on the, um, the, the uh, trainee or the, the, the attendee then, and the and the mask and perhaps a face mask on the client yes something that i will ask is that my client bring their own face masks if they don't we will provide them 
But then that you've got to consider that that has to be added to the cost of their service because you're providing these extra things and it's always going to be at some considerable cost. But with regards to that screen, well, imagine if that failed or it was knocked and hit a client. No, I think that unnecessary also with Perspex is all very well, but the more you clean it, the more it starts to get grained. And when it has grain or any imperfect surface, it then becomes a liability because it will start to become effectively porous and you can't clean it properly. I think it's more a case of making sure that people can't, you know, when you've got a sheet, a face shield and a face mask, that's ample. Um, and that everything is washed and cleaned properly. Every chair, as it's relieved from that particular client, is cleaned instantly. I don't believe in the use of cloths, and no disrespect to um, the lady that was talking earlier, microfibers and things, no. If you're cleaning, you're thinking about kill it and sort of catch it, or clean it, catch it, and disposing of it, you need to have disposables. Um, I've literally put, I, I brought all of my cleaning products in from a professional um, cleaning service so that everything is antibacterial, so that it's all to a set standard. And they are stationed around the salon with the center pull rolls, the blue and the white center pull rolls. And yes, you'll go through a lot of them, but you spray everything down thoroughly, you wipe it down nice and dry, and if you're working every other, you can, you can move from one to another while that one is drying. And if, as long as you adhere to a strict social distancing rule, then you're safe. You know? so, Wayne, th th thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate the contribution. I'm sure, sure everyone found, found it really useful. I, I'm conscious of the time and people need to, to, to be stepping away to other meetings shortly. Um, I just want to move on to the questions and, and answers session um, and give people the opportunity to ask any questions of, of either Wayne or any of the other contributors from today. At the bottom of the screen, there's a button that says participants. If you, if you press that button, uh, it gives you the opportunity to raise your hand. Um, and so if you'd like to raise your hand and then uh, unmute and ask your question uh, of any of the uh, contributors today. Come on, you're not your old hairdressers, you can't be shy. <laughs> Any questions at all? One of the things that I'm that is a concern of mine, that I will say, with implementing proper training and the you know doing it all in the virtual world. Now, I've always provided very hands-on training, as I say, and I'm able to address and monitor um, my apprentice's training very, very effectively. And um, if you're not able to see what they're not doing right, you know, you can't, you can't monitor somebody in a virtual world, neither can you really check a virtual haircut. You can't focus. Sometimes somebody's going wrong, and you need to be able to watch them go through the process so that you can see that perhaps it's their manipulation. Perhaps it's, you know, a simple part of the pre can be a key thing that causes it to go wrong, and they need that. Ours is a physical industry, and it needs physical support. And this is a, this is a concern to me. I think, and I think it's a key point that you raised there, is that um, the impression sometimes, particularly when you look at the media um, and look at the conversations, that everyone's in a headlong rush to go virtual only, to go digital only, and something like training, uh, particularly in sectors like, like hair, for example. Um, we also have it in other areas of the business, like childcare and uh, health and social care, is it requires human interaction, it requires some degree of Absolutely training and that and I think the key phrase at the moment is, is blended and I'm gonna ask Simone to, to come back in here and I think probably what we're looking at is there's always been a, a small shift over recent years towards digital delivery because it's more convenient and frankly the market wants that I think probably what we're seeing is it is, is maybe a realignment it can't be all digital and I, I 
but Simone, do you want to jump in and talk about blended uh, learning? Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks, Wayne. I totally uh, agree with you, and that's the challenge that we have. However, we, we, we are talking about what it used to be like, and I understand, yes, you have to check a haircut 100%. However, we need to think of outside the box. Do we need to check every haircut? Can the salon owner not be able to sign a certain percentage off and then we maybe do an end loan tra trade test. We need to think about how to move forward um, instead of trying to put what we, do, what we did know back into a box. We, we need to kind of, this is our opportunity to explore as much as we can as employers and as industry experts, as um, awarding bodies, we need to be able to make it right for all of us. But yes, yes, Wayne, I agree. I'm also on the, on the fence about let's embrace this change and make something better. It, yeah. just part as well. We've got to be very cautious about going overkill. Totally. Is, an awful yeah. lot of this, um, an awful, a, lot of, a lot of the actions have been fed by paranoia. All right. The fear, yes, the fear of getting ill and the fear of cross-contamination. Um, and media hasn't really helped at all. Now, don't get me wrong, you couldn't be more cautious than me. I've, I've been hospitalized from pneumonia previously, and I know what it feels like to, to simply feel like suddenly you have no reason to drown when you're in dry air, right? And it's scary, and I don't want to go there again. So I, I was probably one of the first people to walk around with a mask on. I'd be sort of in a queue, and people looking at me like I'm some sort of freak mask, gloves, even cleaning my gloves before I touch my car doors. And then when I get into the car, I'd remove them. So you can exercise good caution, but what we also have to consider is that you know, we can cripple ourselves through overkill in terms of too many screens when it's simply not necessary. Key thing here, I think, is touch, all right? So a lot of people say, you know, I can't work with gloves on. Because when you, one of the simplest things, you're all looking at your screens now, and if you've got touch screens, look at the fingerprints. No matter how clean your hands are, you're giving off natural oils and such, and you're leaving fingerprints. It's all about touch, more so than anything. You know, what we touch, how we cross contaminate it, and as long as we provide ourselves with face shields and masks, we're not dispersing anything from ourselves and we're limiting what can come to us. But learn to, to, to practice your, your craft with gloves. Get suitable fitting gloves. Again, for me, I'm kitting all of my staff out with properly fitting gloves, with their own aprons, with their own masks, with their own shields. But as I say, it's all, I've got a nice little pile in the house here because I've had it all to, sort of delivered here. But it's available for you and you've just got to spend the time looking comparing prices and making it work for you and at the end of the day it's all tax deductible so don't don't worry about it because you've got to be able to factor that into the price of everything anyway you know these are things that we have to do and what we need to be seen is as responsible as possible um, one of the things i don't know if you're aware that local councils the Jambara Council, I'm doing um, a course with regards to COVID awareness, where we will have a certificate of compliance, which again, you seem to be responsible. And they actually give you a free screen with that, which was very nice. But, um, you know, these are the things that were, yeah, correct and proper signage, but everybody's conditioned to that now. So as long as there are directives and that they are giving good direction and you make it clear as to what you want them to do then you know in terms of no more magazines could you please please bring your own digital media could you if you know you will need to wear a mask if you have one please wear it if not we will provide it for you our clients are told they have to go and wash their hands or we've got hand sanitizer for them i would rather they wash them um, I removed door handles that didn't have to be used and either put kick plates and automatic returns. I removed light switches and put motion detectors on. I've, as I say, you've got hand towels everywhere, so it's all disposable. There are sprays everywhere, so that's 
there and these are things that are made clear to people. That Wayne, I think that's a very good point as well with um, the making it clear for the customer. I think we need to, that, that's the whole idea here for salon owners is making the customer confident to come into your salon um, and with signage. Um, it's, it's like any business. Um, it's very, very, you're very anxious as a customer. I'm sure you all experience Tesco's or the supermarket um, and you don't know the rules. And if you don't know the rules, you're anxious. And then that kind of gives you a barrier about entering. Is it safe for me? Is, can I, do I have to enter with, with a person? Do I touch the trolley? It is all about clear um, signage, I, I believe too. I think one of the things- I, I don't know, Oh, sorry, 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 sorry Wayne. I, I was going to invite into conversation the um, Grant, who's our CEO for the Educate Group. I can see he's yeah. got his hand up there, and I think I've got a trade in. Yeah, just to reinforce some of the discussion we've had about um, the, 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 the online, the training, and the digital training, just to and reassure people, we're not going to go to 100% digital online training. We're in that environment now because obviously we have to, um, and, and we don't have a choice at the moment. Uh, what we see, and Tim mentioned the blended training, we see an opportunity here now to challenge everything we do and how we do it. Um, and we're, gonna, we're going into a different environment and we've got to think differently. We've got to be innovative. We've got to be creative and look at how we can deliver the training uh, in, in, in a different world, really. So we don't see that it will be 100% online. That we will continue with face-to-face, -face, but there'll be a much more blended approach to it. And as Simone said earlier, you know, it could be using sort of working with employers uh, in a work-based assessor capacity, witness testimonies, observ online observations. Uh, we think about uh, webinars, demonstrations. So all these different things in terms of, and I guess as, as this is an we this is an opportunity now to really raise the bar in some of the training and development that we offer, and and particularly on the apprenticeship side of things. Um, and and we we need to raise that bar. We have to change how we deliver and what we deliver. The other point I think is important for all sound owners and business to be aware: all our staff will be trained uh, and supported in order when they go out to visit employers and businesses, they will also have the correct uh, PPE, uh, correct training to make sure that the environments they go in that they're able to go into that environment and and they understand. The challenges and 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 the 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 precautions in those environments as well because it, it's important from you yourselves as businesses to know that if you have external people come in that they understand the environment they're going into and they understand the precautions and they, and they've also got the ppe themselves as well so so we're going through that at the moment but we we see we, we are really going through a big game changing um uh, over the next couple of months where a lot of the hair and beauty um, delivery models that, that we currently offer will be digitized, um, but it will be have that blended, uh, that blended experience. Um, so, so that's, that's important from just, for, just to provide a bit of reassurance to you yourselves that you know, we're not going digital 100%, much more blended, but this use the opportunity to do things differently and do it better. Can I just add to that? I think perhaps with regards to such things as PP and salon hygiene, etc., it should be implemented as part of level one and perhaps periodically retouched upon. But there's um, one other concern that I know I have, and um, obviously the cost of training. An awful lot of salons haven't been able to implement the sort of training that I've been fortunate enough to be able to. Uh, provide for my staff simply because they, they can't afford to you know every hour they spend is putting money in the bank paying the wages paying the bills clearing the overheads now this has made it almost impossible and whereas as I say we are expected to pay them for their training time now when I was trained I was fortunate to be offered that training but I had to make a commitment and I had to give up my time now this isn't the mindset now now if this is the case then a lot of sounds simply won't be able to provide them with correct and proper training because they don't have the time it's not now down to funds now it's down to time
because every minute is trying to pay the bills, clear the overheads, you know, to pay their wages. Because now you're going to be working on a base minimum amount where each person has to bring in X amount of money per hour just to cover the cost of having them there and your outgoings, etc. So additional costs such as training is going to be a massive overhead. Now, that given, is there going to be some sort of leniency where perhaps client, um, staff uh, would be allowed to volunteer their time if we volunteer ours as additional time? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Yeah. Every minute matters now when it comes to business. Every yeah. minute matters yeah. now in our industry. Yeah. And that can't be okay. A, a key piece of work for us to do over the next two, three weeks, um, and, and we're in the process of planning that out now, is understanding what it is that salon owners want from us and, and also other companies who provide training. Um, because the needs won't necessarily be uniform across everyone else, which is why really we wanted to start doing these V-meets. Um, there'll be a programme of reaching out really to the marketplace, to you guys who are on the call, so that can we, we can really understand what it is that you want from us over the next six months and, and 12 months. And so I do encourage everyone on the call when, when those emails come in and those phone calls to come in, please, please let us know what it is that, that you need from us as well. And I think what you mentioned there is clearly the biggest one is the priority for most of the businesses is to get their business back up on its feet. Um, but also people still need training. We still need new blood coming in. So um, it's important that we understand what it is that, that, that the market requires. Grant, do you want to come in on anything before? No, 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 just it's really, really useful, actually. And I, and I think um, what's really important to us uh, as, as a business, as a, as a training business, is, is to understand um, from, in, from employers and businesses uh, what you need from us um, to really gather that feedback and to really make sure whatever we're doing is meeting and supporting the needs of employers as well as supporting needs of apprentices. Uh, and that's key. So please, you know, please feed that information back into us um, and that is really going to um, support the development uh, and evolution of how we deliver apprenticeship training uh, in, in the future and, and what is delivered as well. I think one clear positive thing that's come from this, which is a, that this morning is, is an example of, that it's opened up a dialogue amongst us all again and that we're communicating and that we are willing to share ideas and not feel so insular, not so feel so singular, that we've all made time to come together and to sit and listen and share our ideas and offer each other support. Um, and I think it's, it's good that it's sort of reconnecting us because generally an awful lot of the time, unless there is a gathering somewhere that's pre-organized and only those that can make it get there we don't see each other we don't discuss you know and we don't understand we don't then feel that we're all in the same boat mm. and this is a time that yes we should be able to come together and discuss things and to give each other support so you know that being said if any of you need to you know perhaps run some ideas past myself or it you know, as I say, any of the, the other people involved in any of this, then yeah, because it, sometimes a, it can be the simplest things that we don't know. And I'd like, to, I, I would enjoy the fact that should I need to be able to ask, that I could reach out and ask one of you. Somebody's going to have the answer, you know? Yeah. We can't all know everything. No, I agree. Uh, one of the positives maybe that's come out of COVID-19 is both in a business sense and, and in a enabling sense, a sense of community. You, you see a lot more working together, I think. And that, that's going to be key going forward, I think. If, is, is there any questions before, before I bring this to a close? I'm, I'm conscious we've overrun and some people have had to uh, step away already. Uh, last chance for any more questions? No? Okay. Well, look, thank you ever, ever so much to everyone for giving up your time this morning. Thank you to the contributors. We'll send up out a wash-up email to everyone who registered to be here today with the signposting links and the information that the contributors have given. Um, and it may well be that we come back and revisit this in a few weeks when the advice changes from government. Um, if you've got any feedback on this session, please feed it back to us as to how it could be improved or changed or if there's any topics that you'd like to see discussed in the future. 
ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take, Take care, care, everyone.